Hello everyone, you're listening to episode four, and today we are discussing network and relationship marketing and the advantages it has for people thinking about getting into business, but maybe aren't sure where to start. Our guest today is Matt Sherb, who is a self-made entrepreneur with strong relationship building skills that have allowed him to substantially grow his network and influence. Like so many, Matt will be sharing his background with us today, as well as how he broke free from the corporate rat race to design the life that he and his family wanted to live. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Merged Marketing Podcast with David Louch and Jason Hunt. This is a show all about unlocking the marketing tactics and secrets behind everyday brands. Each week, we'll bring you expert commentary so that you can make better choices when it comes to growing your business. Thank you for spending time with us. Now let the show begin. And we're live. Jay and I welcome you back for yet another interesting episode of the podcast. So thank you very much for tuning in. We have a very special guest today, someone that I consider to be a friend and mentor, Mr. Matt Sherb. Welcome to the show, Matt. Hey, Jay and David. How are you guys doing? Doing good, doing good. Doing great, thank you. Um, Okay, so uh, we will get right into it. Um, So today we're going to be discussing business and marketing from two different but related points of view, networking and relationship building. So Matt, um, I guess we'll start with the first question that we always like to start with, uh, with all of our guests, and that that is just uh, your backstory. So really, um, you know, where are you from and basically what life experiences led you to where you are today? Feel free to start wherever you want. Hey, awesome. Okay. Well, um, I guess what I'll, I'll start with is my background has been in corporate for, say, 50% of my career and spent a lot of time learning all about the the different things relative to business, you know, whether it's call center technology, how to manage teams and things like that. And learned a lot in that, but realized that in that space, I was always a number for someone else. I wasn't my own, I didn't have control of my own destiny. So about 14 years ago, I started my own, I'll say consulting practice for lack of better terms, leaving the corporate world And I started studying all sorts of different ways to earn an income because when I was in corporate, I focused a lot on putting time into the office and getting paid, whether it's on an hourly basis or a salary basis. But being self-employed, I could start taking a look at things like leveraging my income, getting passive income, having residual income. So I looked at all sorts of different things as an entrepreneur to see what really resonated the most for myself. And I was doing things like real estate investing and I was running an online store, an e-commerce store. So always looking at ways to leverage my income, leverage my time, using other people's money, using other people's ideas. And I really landed on the whole concept of being an entrepreneur and being able to really chart my own destiny. And that's really where I've had the most, I'll say fun, if you could say that, over the last 13 to 14 years is really just charting my own destiny, but being able to come up with creative ways to to really focus on providing the financial well-being for my family. Interesting. So, I mean, you know, what kind of, uh, like what, what kind of feelings were you having when you were making that transition from the corporate life to uh, a much seemingly uh, more unstable, unsafe sort of lifestyle as an entrepreneur? Well, it was interesting because I, I had a, a few holy crap moments, if I can use those terms, I could use that politely on a podcast. Um, because when you're in a corporate environment, I, I was in an ivory tower and I always thought that I had a cushy job. I had a fantastic job. I, I loved my job in the travel industry, could travel the world. But I always thought that being an employee gave me benefits. It gave me financial benefits. It gave me uh, retirement benefits. It gave me health and wellness benefits for my family. Mm -hmm. But all the while, what I didn't realize is being my own boss, I could also purchase those those benefits. There's lots of organizations out there that provide health insurance. So I have the same benefits, if not better benefits, but I didn't have to be employed. It was kind of this this face, I'll say false sense of security per se. Mm -hmm. But being out on your own, you've got the holy crap moments because you've got to make sure you've got income coming in and you're really working towards your next sale and you're only as good as your next sale. 
And so I had to chart some new things. I had to learn some things. And and it's one thing to be employed and know that you got that paycheck coming in every couple of weeks or twice a month. But when you're self-employed, you're making sure that you've either put reserves in place so that you're able to provide for your family, Mm -hmm. or you got to make sure that you're selling much faster and having a lot more success or making sure your margins change so that you're able to to provide as well. So it's it's a, it's a different angst per se um, that I, I'd, I'd put out there. But then at the same time, when you take into consideration the tax brackets, if you're you know self employed, you're paying your expenses out of your revenue. So your tax, the taxes you pay to the government are going to be on a, a lower percentage because your expenses come out of your revenues first and foremost, whereas in an employed environment, your taxes get taken out of your salary. And that's when you pay for everything after that. So you're paying everything with after tax dollars in your personal world, versus in an, an, an employment an entrepreneur world, you're actually paying with your pre tax dollars, which makes a very big difference. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, that, it's interesting that is it, even just hearing your story and, and the way you kind of made that leap from the corporate world um, to entrepreneurship. And, you know, What's interesting, we can go down so many rabbit holes um, based on what you just said, but really it's, I'm interested to hear, you, you, you use the term chart, uh, chart your own destiny. And, you know, during that sort of, and obviously there's ebbs and flows with entrepreneurship, but with all the different types of entrepreneurial endeavors that you went down, at what point of the journey, maybe you can speak to just a couple of the failures um, that mm-hmm. you experienced in the past in order to get to where you are today. And, and what, at what point of that journey um, did you did you did you say hey okay I'm gonna have to put in the, throw in the towel on this one and move on to the next one? Mm-hmm. Sure, okay, so the, that's valid. So, a couple of things that I looked at. I I talked about having an online business. So, again, for myself in the corporate world, I felt I was a number, and I I really came back from being an employee and saying being an entrepreneur. I didn't want to be. I guess I didn't want to be accountable to my family with one source of income again. So I had multiple streams of income. So in having um, an online business, I did a lot of research on products that would sell. And and back then we were talking about eBay and Amazon in their infancy. So I'd have some products. I'd I'd be buying things at Costco, for instance. I'd do some research. I'd find there's some products at Costco that if I was to put them on eBay, they had a very high sell-through rate and I could double my money. Mm. Or I could have a product that I purchased from a, a... a supplier in Mississauga that no one else was selling on Amazon or eBay. And I could put that on the marketplace and that was great. And it was super, I could be on the beaches of the Dominican Republic. And all I was doing is creating way bills with FedEx, getting them to the warehouse and having the products shipped for me. So I had no cash flow implications, which was awesome, but I was at the mercy of a supplier. I didn't control my supply chain. I also didn't control where I was selling these products to. So for instance, the supplier that was creating my one product, their core costs, because they were petroleum based products, went up with the fuel prices. All of a sudden my product became very expensive, my margins shrunk, and then they went out of business. All of a sudden it's like, holy moly, I just lost my prime source of income from a very large provider. It's like, okay, take a look back. Do I want to keep doing this? Is this the lifestyle that I want to have? The other product I had was in the, um, I'll say it's in the consumables part of it. It was a skin cream. And as soon as it went to the US, all of, it, was, it was great. We had great sales. We were probably selling about $15,000 worth of hand cream to the US on a monthly basis. And all of a sudden the FDA said, Oh, we want to make sure that we've screened your product and we're allowing it back into the U.S. So you're dealing with outside influences that sometimes you don't control the destiny. And even though I had a product that was made in the U.S., I didn't want the aggravation of having to deal with customs and duty and all these other things. So that's at that point, I said, OK, I'm going to throw the towel in. I'm very successful, but it's not necessarily the lifestyle that I wanted to have. I wanted to have the beach lifestyle, but I didn't want it to come with the aggravation and the the trials and tribulations of having to source suppliers and things like that. So I was picking and choosing the best of all the worlds and starting to apply that to what my end goal was going to be. So I knew I wanted to do something online, but it wasn't necessarily product based. Or I'd start investing in real estate in the U.S., 
Um, we'd go to auctions. And again, I thought it was a great opportunity if you, if you purchase a, a property and you put a rental tenant in and you get paid month, month, month in, month out, you get rental income. It's only good until a tenant leaves you. It's a risk. Can your stomach tolerate that risk? So for me, it was trying to do mi risk mitigation, again, to find out what my end goal is. I love to have residual income. I love passive income. So I take that knowledge and I apply it to what my end game is. So really now I've taken all that knowledge. I've sold some businesses and I've closed some businesses and I rest at the spot where I'm creating a lifestyle that I can do from anywhere in the world. I'm not accountable to a company. I chart my own course, but I'm taking the best of all worlds. So I'm able to do consulting for people from anywhere. I don't have to be in physically the location that I am because with technology tools, we can be all over the world. Mm. So I can provide information and knowledge to people through consulting. I can provide unbelievable targeted um, client acquisition through various social media platforms and advertising. Great. I can do that from anywhere. I can do it from the beach. I can do it from my home. I can do it from a cruise ship. Mm -hmm. And then I also have a product offering that offers me residual and recurring income because I feel that that's where my future is. I don't want to do the work when I'm 80 years old. I want to do the work now and be paid into okay. the future yeah. based on different models. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. So you mentioned a few different things, um, kind of your backstory and, and leading up to, to where you are now. You mentioned some consulting, some some real estate, uh, some flipping, which is cool. You know, I find a lot of uh, entrepreneurs start out their their journey uh, flipping products on eBay or, uh, you know, whatever it might be. So, you know, after you left the corporate world, what was the first thing you got into? You know, was it consulting? Was it real estate? Was it flipping? What What was the first thing? The first, very, 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 very first thing that I got into was um, into eBay selling and Amazon selling. Okay. And, and you know, did you find a lot of success in that? 100%. What was the marketing like there? Were you marketing, advertising at all on these platforms? No, I was taking advantage of the marketing that they were doing themselves on eBay and Amazon. This is going way back before uh, fulfillment by Amazon and different platforms that they came out with. But I just said, heck, if somebody's going to be on eBay buying something, they've already got their wallet open. I just have to provide them with a product that they're willing to buy. So I allowed eBay to do the advertising. Interesting. Okay, so... Um, you know, you started out first in, uh, in, uh, eBay flipping. And then I think from, from just, you know, knowing you as well as I do, I think the next thing was probably real estate you got into. Yep. So I got into real estate and um, bought and sold some properties here in Canada, found that the market was fantastic back then. This is back in the 2008, 2009 period, but it was very capital intensive. Yeah. So yes, you could use other people's money, you could use banks, but you were limited as to how much you could invest. And at that time, something in the US was going on with their whole economy and you were buying properties at cents on the dollar in the US. So I could actually step into a marketplace in the US, set myself up with you know, corporations and structures and things like that, but to purchase real estate in the US mm -hmm. where we were buying houses back then, it's not like that now, but we were buying houses for $3,000, $8,000, that were almost tenant ready, or they needed about $10,000 of, of repairs to it to make them tenant ready. Okay. So it's like, couldn't do that here in Canada, did that in the US. Well, then all of a sudden, I, I knew I had this background in eBay. I knew I loved doing some of this real estate investing and being able to take advantage of the marketplace. So we started buying and selling real estate on eBay. Wow. We were buying houses in Rochester for $1,500 on eBay. Now, those days are not there anymore, no. but when you're an entrepreneur, you're constantly looking for ways to take an opportunity and turn it into an even greater opportunity. Okay. You're bringing things together. So I'll bring eBay together with real estate. How can I make that mesh and turn it into something? So constantly looking as an entrepreneur, we, we almost have a sixth sense looking for these opportunities. Pain point, opportunity, Marriott, is there a further opportunity? Of course. Yeah, no, that, you that's the, you got David really excited there when you're talking about <laughs> rental properties for 1500 in Rochester. He's actually searching it as we speak. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I, went, I went to an auction, believe it or not, and I saw somebody actually buy a house for 100 bucks. I wrote down the address. I thought, oh my goodness, 100 bucks. I'll just buy that for 100 bucks. And they bought an actual house that was renting for $700 a month. It's just 
it was opportunities that we just never saw. Mm-hmm. And uh, that is incredible. Well, you certainly can't uh, you certainly can't get that out here in Guelph where we are, but uh, that that would be nice. <laughs> You could probably get something at the grocery store for hundred bucks, not a house. That's right. Um, perfect. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. So I want to start transitioning into, yep. um, you know, you, you got into consulting, uh, eBay flipping, uh, real estate. I want to start transitioning into when network and relationship marketing came in. What, like when did that, uh, when did that happen? Yep. So I, I learned early on that my network, so again, in my corporate world, I never really built a network. I thought, I've got a job. Why do I need to network? And when I became an entrepreneur, I realized that you're only, and, and from reading, you're only as good or your, your network is your net worth. So I really started going out to networking events and really get, getting my sphere of influence together um, through reading, reading uh, Think and Grow Rich and learning about masterminds and things like that. I started to really fill myself up with with lots of um, self-development because these are all things that I didn't have in my corporate world. And that self-development really changing my mindset. So networking became very key. Being able to connect with individuals. Sometimes you wouldn't have the information yourself, but you could pick up the phone and call someone for information. Having trusted advisors. Whether, it's, whether it was from real estate, whether it was from, from business transactions that I did, someone always had answers that I may or may not have had myself. And that's where the networking really started to take, uh, take shape, whether it was in a real estate sphere, whether it was in an entrepreneurial uh, environment. There's all different ways that you can network out there. Um, there's structured networking groups. There's meetups. Mm-hmm. Again, just building your sphere of influence so that if you ever come across an issue or a challenge, mm-hmm. you pick up the phone and you've got somebody that can can give you some advice. Now, Matt, what do you think has been some of the best uh, opportunities for networking in, in your vast experience? Like where have you seen um, the best opportunities? Um, I hate to put it in terms of ROI, you know, because we're talking about personal relationships. But what would you say mm-hmm. is the best way uh, in terms of spending your time in regards to networking? So, I, I, you know, the Meetup is, is a great venue out there. Um, BNI is a great venue out there. And again, it, it plays in different spaces depending on the business that you're in. I find the more you're financially investing into a network, the more you can expect the return to be as long as you're playing the game correctly. So if I'm going to go into a Meetup and I'm just meeting somewhere at a bar or a restaurant and I'm going to be paying two bucks for a pop or five bucks for a pop, I can expect that the referrals I'm going to be getting from that venue or from that event are going to be smaller ranged referrals. It's not going to be the same. I really got to build my network. I really got to build my relationships with regards to that. Because think about it. When you go to a networking event, are you going there to buy? Probably not. But there's a lot of people that go there thinking they've got to sell you. Mm -hmm. And that's where the relationship has to start. And that's where you have to build a relationship. It's not about handing out business cards. It's about really building strong relationships and understanding and listening to the other person. BNI is another opportunity, very structured, meet every single week. It's an investment because you're paying for your meeting room fees and you're paying for being part of BNI. But the higher the investment, the higher return can be because there's a whole system that goes with it. It's not just a meetup where I'm going to go buy a beer with somebody and chat. There's actually a structure that goes to it. So there's lots of spectrums with regards to that. Mm -hmm. There's also real estate investment clubs that you can network with. Again, if I'm going to spend $200, I expect the networking to be maybe a little less than something that might be $1,400 or $1,500 a year. Generally, when you're doing your due diligence, the more you're investing, the more expectations of the members to get a return. Mm -hmm. Interesting is, is talking about ROI, but um, also like the, the return on investment of time, I think is a key one. And it's, it's, what's interesting is, you know, us living in the digital space, um, you know, when you talk about physical networking, another opportunity that lies out there, a lot of people neglect is the opportunity to build a community on uh, like Facebook. Facebook group is, is a great opportunity to really build a tribe it's uh, an opportunity to position you as that authority that if you do have that Facebook group, you know, you are naturally that authority, but you also get to moderate the members within that group. 
Um, it's essentially like hosting your own BNI or meetup event, but digitally, right? And very targeted because I could only I can decide who I want to invite in. I could say I only want to invite left-handed golfers. I only want to have males or females or this age group. When you start layering on that, the target that you're wanting to to attract and be that laser focused, you can say I only want to have people that are expats from Europe. You can create a community very rapidly. And so in the digital space, there's a lot to be said about that, Jay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, just for the listeners out there, I mean, um, Matt is probably one of the best networkers I've ever met, you know, and, and just through hearing his experience so far, he's had a lot of years uh, of practice um, through different uh, businesses, different networking organizations. Uh, Matt and I, we met through BNI. So we're both current members of uh, a BNI chapter here in Ontario. Um, and uh, he has taught me a lot about networking. So Matt, I want to um, move into specifically the network marketing industry uh, itself. I, wa I just want you to share kind of your experience in that industry. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll start there. But really, I, I want to kind of get a good definition of, of what it exactly is, because I think it's somewhat of a contested topic and a lot of people don't truly um, understand what it is and, and instead think um, think of it in a negative sense, uh, AKA pyramid schemes. Sure. So there's, there's different things that I would say with regards to that. Um, it, a lot of it has to do with leverage. When you're employed, when you're self-employed, you want to leverage yourself. And there's different ways that you can earn an income. You can have other people's money, which is like going to the bank and putting some money down in, on a real estate property and only you putting in 25% yourself and using other people's money to purchase something. You may want to use other people's time, other people's ideas. And when you get into the network marketing realm, you start to see that happen. Sometimes, um, you know, other people's ideas could be something as simple as someone's invention doing something. Other people's time, you have employees in your organization that are doing work. Well, in network marketing terms, it's no different because you're able to take other people's ideas because they've created a product, a marketing message, mm -hmm. or you've got teams of people that are working and replicating with you. So there's other people's time. So it starts to leverage things mm -hmm. where it starts to get some, I'll get, I'll, I'll say where, where you get some more um, difficulty or people start to get a, a negative feeling around it is people tend to be attracted to that industry because it's a low cost to start up. Mm -hmm. It's not very expensive to get into a network marketing or a direct sales business. So they're expecting though, because they put a low, low threshold in for joining, you can start um, in some of these for as little as $59, but they expect that they're going to make a million dollars out of it. So they're going to networking meetings and they're the ones that are pulling business cards and, you know, telling you how it's the best products in sliced bread. They're not building a relationship. And when you're building a relationship, which is key in everything that you do, it's very different. So I have friends who are in, in network marketing businesses that you couldn't even figure out what it is that they do because it's their business. You're buying from them. You're building a relationship. The product just happens to be a bonus. Mm -hmm. The model is is one part of it. So yeah, it gets the terminology of, oh, it's one of those pyramid schemes. And there was a lot of negative press around that back in the 70s and the 80s. Um, but truly, it is a very successful model for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And where people tend to have a, a gray area is, why is there so much commission? Why is this or why is that? And not really understanding the model that well. Mm -hmm. A lot of these companies do no marketing. Yeah, They don't have signs at the side of, of the highway saying, hey, you know, buy this product from this bank, they're putting the advertising into that, the salesperson, that direct salesperson. Yeah. And so they've saved themselves a large chunk of money. I mean, what what's Nike's um, annual budget for advertising? It's in the billions, if not trillions. If they took all those costs and pass it on to the end person, there's going to be somebody else that can make con commission through that. Yeah. That's where a lot of people start to say, well, gee, there must be something really strange or shady there because they're paying a lot of money. Well, these companies just haven't put a lot of money into their marketing budget. Yeah. Interesting. Well, thank you for, for kind of clarifying that. I think it's important because you're right. You know, I, uh, you know, just through talking to you and learning 
from you. Um, there's a lot that I learned about the industry that I, that I didn't necessarily know before. And, you know, some of my negative perceptions that I had, um, you know, kind of went away when I did my, my due diligence and actually do research into it, which, you know, maybe a lot of people don't do. So, you know, with that being said, you know, who do these businesses appeal to most and, um, you know, who, who can benefit from them uh, and gain experience in order to get their, their you know, foot in the business door, uh, so to speak? So from a direct sales or, or multi-level marketing type business, who does that appeal to mostly? Yeah. Um, generally, it's going to be individuals who are looking for a better way. It's going to be individuals who might be looking for a side hustle because they've got bills that they've got to pay. So it could be something that's employed. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've worked with people that are in direct sales that are 70 years old. I've been working with people that are 18 or 20 years old. Um, it really depends on the mindset of people that are wanting to make a difference in their lives. And I actually would say people that get involved in a direct sales or a network marketing business generally are on some sort of a journey to make themselves better. So there's a lot of self-development in there. There's a lot of learning because they might be an employee that's getting into that entrepreneur mindset, but they now have a system that they can follow to do that. Whether it's a company like Amway, whether it's a company like Herbalife, we've, these companies have all been around. Some of our parents have been in some of these companies. They've got outstanding training. And so from a self-development perspective, it's fantastic. So age demographic really doesn't make a difference, but it's people that want to have a better way, um, people that want a residual income or that they want to have um, uh, passive income. Really, it's, it's a fairly wide spectrum of people that can participate in it. Um, Stay-at-home moms. Yeah, I found that, I found that uh, interesting that when, when we were talking a second ago about, about you know, what gives, why is there so much negativity around uh, multi-level marketing, right? Like, and you said, you know, maybe it's a low point of entry in terms of cost. I find that it, it does make sense in a whole bunch of other levels. You know, I, I've been to a ton of trade shows where, you know, the, the ticket to entry was free, right? And, and I think that it, it, what comes along with free entry to a trade show is low quality of attendees, right? It's almost like right. people, if people are willing to invest uh, into whatever it is they're doing, the, you know, the, the misper, I guess, I don't know, how, how would you say it? But the, you know, it's basically like, you know, the more you pay, the, the more play you're going to get, right? Yep. They sort of, in, in any sort of regard. And in this one here specifically, I, I, I get it. That makes total sense. It's almost like the investment of time. There's a lot of investment and in time involved to get you to where you need to be. In these, in these kind of multi-level marketing companies, right? And and I think that's why it has that kind of negative connotation. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and, and you know, people are, are being sold that dream. So they they see people, and, and I personally know people that are making multiple seven figures a month, and so they want that same dream. So they anticipate, if I put my money into this opportunity, whether it's $200, $700, or $1,000, or even $10,000, I expect a return of $100,000 a month to happen immediately. It doesn't happen overnight. And so there's, there's a gap between what they're putting in versus what they're truly going to get back because they've got to put the effort in. It does take work. It's, not, it's, it's network marketing. It's not net play marketing. You've got to put the effort in. You've got to follow systems. And sometimes people aren't coachable. Even people in, who are employees for companies may not be coachable and they don't have success. So it's just two different things. And um, sometimes that gets negative press because you'll tell 10 friends if something went wrong with a product that you bought somewhere. And so if they don't have the success they have, they'll tell 10 friends and it gets negative press and they tell two friends and they tell two friends. And all of a sudden, thousands of people have heard the bad experience. They don't hear the good experience. There's people I know that have had outstanding experiences and they've been able to give money back to the community and, and donate and do things, philanthropic things. You don't hear about all those stories. You hear about the, the the bad press more than the good press. And you've also got government bodies that, whether it's the FTC in the U.S. that feel, oh, it's one of those pyramid things. Well, it's it's not necessarily, it's it's, it's just a different model that allows people to um, earn an income without having to go to school for 10 years and come out of school in debt. What's a different model? They say, I think it's like uh, what, 80, 90% of first time uh, or first or businesses, startup businesses fail, you know, does that 80 and 90% of startup businesses failing translate over to this type of business where there's people that are getting involved 
Um, how, what percentage would you say actually see success when they join up for, uh, for this type of a program? It, you know, it, that's a really interesting statistic. I, the, one of the most recent statistics that I heard with regards to the direct sales industry is that people tend to change companies five to seven times in their career. So somewhere they're looking for success. I've got mentors who have been in one company for, or they've been in 11 companies, had absolutely zero success. They show up at the 12th company and they've had a slam out of the park home run making large seven figures every single month. It's, it's all about mindset and it's all about following the system. For those first 10 or 11 companies, they weren't following the system. They thought they knew better. And when they actually got themselves out of their own way and just allowed the system to work, they had great success. So it's, I don't know if you could really say, is it 90% failure or 10% success or, or which way it is. It really comes down to the individuals. It comes down to the mentorship and it's how well they want to follow instructions. And, and, and I'm assuming a part of that has to do with mapping out those expectations as well. And their realistic expectations with, you know, simple goals that are set for them. You know, obviously it's, 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 it's preaching the fact that this is not a get rich overnight type of a business, right? It does take work grinding it out. And I'll come back to the, the networking. How happy are you when you go to a networking event and someone's in your face selling to you all the time? Some of these people have great passion for their products. Mm -hmm. And so when they get in your face, they'll say, you know, Jay, you've got to, you, you got to take this one product because I lost this or I gained this or I got this health benefit, et cetera. They, they know that the product works well and they're in your face saying, you got to do this while you're going, hey, hang on, I'm not even looking for that product right now. And so that starts to get you to pull back as well. It's like, oh, I don't even want to, I'm going to avoid that cousin because that cousin's, every time I see them, they're telling me about this great product. I'm not interested in it right now. So there's there's human relationship aspects to this too that people have to learn. Absolutely. I'll, I'll tell you a, a short little bit about when, when I started Fresh Crowd back in the day. We must have went through five or six different salespeople uh, when we started the business and, and no one could sell social media in 2016 when it was a relatively easy thing to sell. In 2016, when you're walking into the restaurants and they're like, oh, well, that's cutting edge. We'll give it a shot. Um, nowadays, you can't do that anymore. But back in 2016, I was the only person that was able to sell it. And it's not because I'm some amazing salesperson. It's because I was the product. I was passionate about it. And people could sense that passion when I'm telling them about it. You know, and then it's amazing how far passion can go uh, in, in comparing that to monetary incentive. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, in any business network, uh, marketing or, or otherwise, like for the most part, it's, it's, it relies heavily on the people that are invested and, in, uh, working for the company, uh, the sales force, uh, essentially. Right. So, I mean, and network marketing works no different. They rely on the people that sign up and, and ultimately promote their product. But Matt, you know, they, they must also have some pretty impressive marketing uh, programs within the company uh, set up and, and designed for the people when they do sign up. Is that right? There's obviously their compensation plans, their largest marketing, right? That it's, it's, they'll go to conferences and they'll share things that are going on, but it really comes down to the compensation plan that truly is their marketing plan. Mm -hmm. They'll have a, a digital marketing plan and some companies will have a different plan versus another. Some put a lot of money into their branding. Mm -hmm. Others put their money into the product and research. Um, others will put their money into a lot of the R and D mm -hmm. it varies. Okay. Um, but ultimately it's the compensation plan that really becomes the marketing plan. Cause if, you know you're going to be paid x dollars or do this this activity and this is the reward that you're going to get that's really where the benefit starts to come in so that's where the, the marketing dollars really go would you would you agree that um you know with that being said when there's so much emphasis in this type of a business to build a personal brand that people almost hold themselves accountable on top of the compensation to continue to to do a good job and continue to work and hustle because it's not only you know it's not only x's and o's it's actually their face behind it right Absolutely. And that's where I would take a step back and say, as opposed to tying your product to you, you be your own product. Mm -hmm. And so the branding that you're putting out there, because people are going to buy you. It's not the product per se. When you're in network marketing, you, I, I know friends that have moved from company to company, you wouldn't even be able to find out what company they are, but it's the model that they're buying into, but you're truly 
building the relationship with them. You're building the relationship with me. It's not the product. If I was selling widgets or I was selling wadgets, it doesn't matter. It's myself. It's my integrity that's on the line. And that's what I, I'm promoting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, this is uh, this has been a great episode so far. Matt has been uh, dropping a lot of value and a lot of interesting uh, information. So uh, stick around. We are going to take a quick break and hear from our sponsors. And we will be right back. And now a word from our sponsor. This week's episode is brought to you by our good friends at CF Landscaping. Their services don't just end at designing and creating innovative landscapes, but also helping to maintain the quality and appearance of the properties they service. Check these guys out at cflandscaping.ca. Okay, man, we are back from the break. Thank you for sticking around. Uh, for those of you that are just joining in now, before the break, we heard from Matt a little bit about his backstory um, and how he left the corporate world and uh, got into business for himself, started in consulting, real estate, flipping products online, and then in ultimately into uh, network marketing. So um, he went into what network marketing is and what it is not, as well as who these businesses appeal to and can help the most. Um, so Matt, you know, I just am curious, have you, uh, are you familiar with the book, uh, The Business of the 21st Century by Robert Kiyosaki? I'm familiar with the book. I have not read that book yet. Okay. I thought maybe you could have some insights um, into it, which is totally okay. Cause you know, I did recently read it and, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with who Robert Kiyosaki is um, famously wrote uh, rich dad, poor dad. And he, he wrote this book, which explains the business of network marketing in the context of what makes um, any business a success uh, in, 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 in economic sense and why this is an ideal avenue, uh, to make money for people that might be starting out. So, um, it was just very interesting for me to read that, you know, uh, someone like him was encouraging people to get into network marketing that might be just starting out a business. Yeah. You know, low capital to start, how much does it cost now for a franchise? If you were going to get Tim Horton's franchise or a McDonald's franchise or a subway franchise, I'm not sitting on $250,000 to open up a franchise or $1 million. So you can get into a franchise type model at a very low cost and now put your effort into it and really apply the training systems that they have, all those things at a fraction of the cost of what it is to get into some of these franchises. They're, they're not cheap to get into a franchise. Mm -hmm. Not at all. So, you know, based on that, you know, what, what, what companies for the for the those that are listening that are truly interested in in getting involved in something like this? Um, what companies would you recommend that they look into? You know, ones that you've actually been a part of or that you've just heard good things about or, or know about. Um, do you have any insight on that? So there's there's a ton of companies out there. I mean, the, if you go to the Philippines, there's probably about ten thousand companies that are all in the direct sales business. It's a very very large industry. I would take a step back and take a look at companies that have been around for at least in my own, uh, in my own instances, I like to look at companies that have been around for 10 to 15 years. I like to take a look at the, the management and the leadership of the company, you know, are they rock solid? And then there's also the product aspect. Is it something that you resonate with? If, if you're not into technology services, then don't go into something that has to do with reselling telephones. If you're into living clean, then take a look at a company that's got clean products. If you're into relationship building, there's greeting card companies. If you're into, um, you know, again, the different products, you can find products for everything, but it should be something you're passionate about. Um, and build your brand around that. But ultimately you're building a network around you. It's not so much the, the product, the product is the bonus, but the product that you choose, make it something that's important for, for your own cause. And so, you know, there's, there's coffee companies out there, there's shake companies out there, there's green products out there, there's lots. Do your due diligence. I myself, as I say, look for 10 to 15 years, look for the, the leadership team, look at the compensation plan, but again, it's got to resonate for you. So when, when, if you're comparing that, let's say you're a first timer into the game and you had to prioritize it based on compensation, success stories, and then passion 
what order would you put those in when choosing uh, kind of a niche? So all mm, that's a really that's a tough question because it really starts to have interdependencies with regards to that. So it's a good question, Jay. Um, I'd say passion is going to be a really important part of it. Um, compensation plan obviously is going to be important to it as well. There's pros and cons to different models. Um, there's unilevel, there's dual levels, there's all these different things. Don't get so hung up on that, but it's got to come back to passion because it's got to fuel you. You know, a lot of people say, well, what's your why? Why are you doing this? And if, if you don't know what your why is, nothing's going to happen. Well, if, if you are doing something that you're completely in flow with, you're going to do it at two o'clock in the morning. It doesn't feel like work anymore. So if it's something you're passionate about, if it's something that has a cause that you're going towards, it doesn't feel like work, right? For me, networking doesn't feel like work. I love helping people. I love putting people in front of special products or things or, or opportunities or connecting them in business. It doesn't feel like work. I can do it all day long. I can do it at two o'clock in the morning if I wanted to. It's part of my passion. So I really come back to saying passion is going to be a really big part of it. Um, not at a, a granular product level, but your passion's got to exude in there somewhere. I, and, and it, I think it all boils down to, you know, sales cure all. And if your passion is about it, you're going to be able to sell it. Um, you know, the compensation will come. I mean, it's, it's a question of, you know, getting one or two sales a month compared to potentially getting, you know, 15 to 20 sales a month. If you're really passionate about it, that may be a lower cost to yourself, to your bottom line, right? That's that's um, one part of it. The other might be that, you know, you know that you need to earn $10,000. What's the effort I have to put in to get $10,000 a month? or a hundred thousand dollars a month or whatever. And if you've got a product that generates 50 cents commission on every sale versus a product that's $4,800 a sale. And yes, those companies exist where it's $4,800 a sale and they do exist. Then you've got to decide for yourself. Do I want to sell something at 50 cents 10,000 times, or do I want to have one or two sales at $4,800? There's that part of it too. There's a, there's generally, there might be an income, situation for somebody where they want to put a fire out they've got debts they got to pay and they came out of a job they were making eighty thousand dollars a year am i going to do it making 50 cents off a sale or am i going to make it making a thousand or four thousand eight hundred or whatever off of a sale there's that aspect as well how important are our success stories or proof uh proof important in this whole selection process it's very important um but I will say that the if, if we're talking specifically about that industry, there's success at all corners. I can give you success stories from all parts of the world, all different walks of life. But I've been in the industry now for a few years. For somebody that's brand new that hasn't seen that before, it creates proof. If, if I've got a brand, brand new eyes looking at something and see somebody that, that can actually doesn't speak really good English or hasn't been well trained in school and they're able to make $10,000 a month, they can see themselves in that person. That's important for somebody brand new to the industry. I thought you would prioritize that high as well, just because you did mention that, you know, the fact of, of how long the longevity of a specific, um, you know, program or product is, is important for you. You know, it, it's one of those things that if, let's say I was looking for a certain niche or product to promote, um, you know, passion, obviously, number one. And I don't know if proof for success stories would be as important, especially for like a new product that's emerging. You know what I mean? You might want to hop on that bandwagon before it becomes saturated. You know what I mean? So it's interesting when selecting whether you go that route in comparison to a product that, had, that has had a lot of experience. There's there's shiny object syndrome there too that I, I mm. caution away from. You know, oh, everybody's making money over here. Let's just jump over here. There's a lot of people that jump from from ship to ship based on that. But I think I've been in the industry long enough that I've seen success. So it's that's not as important. I think, you know, you can go to this company or that company, and there are people making large, large sums of money every single month. So I'm not sure whether that's important to me, whereas if I was brand new to the industry, that might be more important to me. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you. That that uh, I hope that helped a lot of people um really dig deep and look internal and uh figure out exactly what they are passionate about and and maybe what they want to get into so matt if you just want to wrap up and share kind of what uh what you're up to now what 
what are you doing? What what's your business that you're currently running? Yeah, so the business that I'm currently running is still in a in um in a marketing model per se, but I'm taking advantage of social media to be laser focused on on my targeting for my audience. So I'm looking for individuals that want to have an online business. I know that I can do that in all parts of the world because Facebook advertising or Instagram advertising or any social media advertising gives me access to data that allows me to target my offering really well. Something that network marketers are big on is selling to family and friends. I'm not a big fan of family and friends. You can burn through your friends and family very quickly. So I like selling to a very hot and, and targeted market based on demographics. And that's what social media does for me. So I'm able to leverage my income, but target my sales to a very, very niched audience, which is more a lookalike audience to myself. You know, parents that have kids that have played baseball, they're going to university, and I can I can really relate to that audience and provide value to that audience. Can you shed some a little bit of light, Matt, on, on how you have leveraged social media to promote the business? So, um, I mean, there's, there's a couple of aspects. Obviously, one of them would be hiring an agency like yourself to support. I mean, I could do it myself or I could leverage it and using an organization like yourself. But I've also used platforms um, such as Meetup or Instagram to really reach out to audiences that are very, um, uh, very specific and, and targeted. Um, so really, from a social media perspective, working with groups, um, you had mentioned, you know, building groups and a, a tribe is really important. Absolutely. We've got a, a group of 35, well, now 37,000 um, entrepreneurs in a closed Facebook group that are supporting each other. And they're all going for one cause, and that's to have a, their own online digital business. So we're able to create that community. So we've got a closed group. I've got my business page. I've got my personal page. All these things are interdependent between each other. But again, to be able to attract a tribe that's very similar to myself because I can provide the most value to that audience. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. And what's so powerful about that is you say similar to yourself. And, and this is what's so intriguing about your business and that industry is when you're trying to seek people that are exactly like yourself, you can create those look like audiences. You can capture people that are liking, sharing, commenting on a piece of content with your face on it, and then tell Facebook to go find people that are just like those people that are engaging on your content, right? That, that, that is, is so powerful. And, and, and we, we strive, and in this business, we strive to always get the right message in front of the right user at the right time. And when it's yourself, knowing the audience, because you are the audience, it makes that bridge so much shorter. You know what I mean? People buy f through relationships. And, you know, some of the questions you asked earlier, you know, what was it like to go from a, a corporate job where you're making multiple six figures to being self-employed? I can relate to that. So if there's anyone out there that is wanting to self-employ and I'm targeting somebody who's been through the same life stories as myself, I can relate to them much easier than, say, yourself would, Jay, or Sally would, or Johnny would. And so as I go through all these life experiences, they've made me who I am, that I can provide support to a community that's been through a similar journey as myself, whether it's kids playing elite baseball or whether it's uh, adults aged between 50 and 63 or whatever the case may be, I have a story. But if you were to put me in front of a millennial right now, that's my son, I probably couldn't relate the same way to that from a sales perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good point. And, uh, and I'm sure you're seeing a lot of success there. Absolutely. Uh, with that. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your time today, Matt, and for, for all your, uh, your wisdom and sharing, you know, for those of you, for those out there that would like to get in touch with you to maybe learn a little bit more about anything that you mentioned today, including um, what you're doing right now and how they can find out more information about that. How can they, how can they do that? How can they reach out to you? I would say just reach out to me on Facebook. Matt Sherb or Facebook uh, yeah, Facebook.com slash Matt Sherb, all one word. Reach out to me. I'd love to uh, connect with you and uh, go from there. It's probably the best platform to reach out to me on. And then certainly we can figure out what your needs are and help you on your journey. 
Awesome. Perfect. Well, that is great. I encourage everybody to reach out, um, you know, especially if you want to become better at networking. Uh, definitely powerful. And, and we, of course, would also love to hear from you as well. You can reach us on social uh, media at, at Merge Media on our website, merge.ca, or by emailing podcast. And of course, rate, review, and subscribe. Uh, okay, Matt, final question. At the end of every single episode, we ask our guest um, a question, and that is, you know, if, uh, if you could choose one person dead or alive uh, to represent your brand, who would it be? Now, because you uh, have a personal brand and it's, and it's you, of course, you don't want someone to represent uh, yourself. That wouldn't work out too good. But um, if you could choose one person dead or alive uh, that inspired you the most, who would it be and why? I'd have to be, say someone um, that comes to mind very early on is someone by the name of Richard Branson. And the reason I choose him is because he's been very innovative. He has taken industries that have been troubled and been able to uh, rise above the ashes in those industries, always had a fantastic outlook on life and done amazing things. And he's really pushed the envelope. I mean, you've got um, Virgin Galactic coming out now. 10 years ago, you wouldn't say we'll be sending planes into outer space. So somebody who's really been leading edge, bleeding edge, and also had a fantastic mindset. I, I look up to him a lot. Yeah, perfect. Well, uh, you and, and many others. <laughs> so thank you. Um, we appreciate your time today again. And, uh, and thank you and all the best. Jay, David, thank you so much. Wow. Well, what a great episode, AJ. I certainly uh, I learned a lot. I don't know about you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's always been this kind of negative connotation around that type of a business, like the quote unquote pyramid scheme or the uh, multi-level marketing. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it, it, and, and he brought up a really good point. A lot of it is, the, you know, the people's thought process around, well, it's just easy barrier to entry. Anybody can do it. And but really, um, there is a lot of hustle involved. It's not as easy yeah. as some people might think. No. Um, you know, and, and it's being smart about it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I can see how it can get annoying if people are just constantly hounding friends and family for a special offer or deal. But really, it, it, it's, it's being creative with the way you go out there and network with people to promote that personal brand. It's, it's an extension from your friends and family. Mm -hmm. And building those call those good those tribes and communities around your personal brand, which is so key to this type of a business. Absolutely, and and yeah, I mean, I'm like most people. I I didn't have a, a favorable view of these uh, of these organizations either. I've had quite a few approach me in the past, and some I've actually looked into to to see what they're all about. And you know, it seems uh, it seems icky uh, the feeling you get when you're being brought in but you know there is a lot of good uh, good organizations out there and it's so funny like I've listened to podcasts in the past or just some uh, some people that I look up to that are in the business world and um, if you really look back to their roots uh, a lot of them actually started out this way mm -hmm. in one of these organizations because like you said you do learn a lot of valuable skills and it does require uh, a lot of hustle so mm -hmm. taking that into whatever you do next uh, can be extremely valuable. And obviously, you know, being a digital marketing agency, you know, we, I would naturally be a little biased to supporting something like this or a business like this because um, the opportunity to this business really does lie on how well you can establish your digital marketing, grow a social media presence for yourself, build a community, you know, be active on social. That's part of the hustle and part of the grind. It's Absolutely. going on Instagram stories, telling your story, um, you know, documenting yourself, being at those networking events, mm -hmm. right? And I think there's a lot of power to that. You're not just sitting on your, on your couch in your basement collecting a paycheck. You're actually working for it, but documenting the work that you're putting into it, showing that hustle, mm -hmm. I think is a huge opportunity for anybody that gets involved in this type of a business. Mm -hmm. Just we talked about it um, there with Matt was the ability to get a very uh, specific advertisement mm -hmm. in front of a very specific audience mm -hmm. on Facebook, you mm -hmm. know, and it's so easy to do that. And that's why you see a lot of businesses out there leveraging the likes of Facebook and Instagram to promote this kind of a business because mm -hmm. that is where the opportunity lies. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it really is all about personal branding. Like you are you know, no matter what the product is, you are the one that is promoting it and pushing it. So, um, yeah, no, it's super interesting stuff. So, um, anyways, 
check us out. Check Matt out. Hope you guys enjoyed the show this week. Hey, and we're always looking. If you guys have ideas for upcoming shows, um, just make sure you drop them here. Who do we have on next week? Next week. You know what? I am uh, drawing a blank. I'm drawing a blank. Man, we're, Believe we're, it or not. It's awesome because we yeah. have a lot of great shows in the pipe here. We got a lot of great guests that are coming up um, from the entrepreneurial space um, that are going to provide tons of value. So mm-hmm. if you do got, if, if anybody out there has any comments on, on topics you want us to discuss during these podcasts, Hey man, we're learning as we go along. Yep. We're in an infancy stage here as well. Um, and we want this to be the best podcast that you have ever heard. Absolutely. So, uh, like subscribe five stars. Let's go rate it. <laughs>